Um, do you mind uh, starting? <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, yeah, um, my background is in machine learning. Um, I've been working on uh, computational chemistry for my postdoc and then in 2008 um, uh, joined Microsoft Research. I was working on yeah, very large scale machine learning um, on advertising data um, for like large scale offline um, offline simulation of what's happening in ad networks, pretty much. And then oh. 2017 um, joined the the Inri team where we are now um, yeah where we've been building first decision forest models for medical images and now since 2019 we've completely switched to deep learning. Um, first with a, a very much homebrew solution, and then we gradually stripped off all of the all of the overhead. And I think the biggest for, a step forward for for us was really uh, switching to PyTorch Lightning. So mm. thanks to you and your team, really good stuff. And yeah, I'm overseeing pretty much all of the engineering efforts and, and trying uh, trying to make sure that we have a, a reliable platform on which we can build um, um, new projects like we're, we're not just starting um, histopathology image classification yep. and uh, still supporting our um, previous mainstay and that is medical image segmentation 3d segmentation okay 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 perfect uh, okay, so on my side, um, I've been working on PyTorch Lightning for yeah a bit more than one year now, I think one year and a couple of months. And I've been leading the teams uh, since then. So we grew quite a lot when I started. We were uh, only three people and now we are close to 10. And there's also like uh, other co-contributors which, um, which are participating to the project. So mm -hmm. I think overall we have like 15 people uh, contributing full time to the project. Wow. That's a lot. And uh, yeah, that's definitely a lot. And, and and like the community is really amazing. So things are really moving extremely fast and we get uh, like more and more new use cases. So it means lightning has to become more flexible too and more stable. Yeah. Um, so we built, uh, I, I led the development of the fault tolerance uh, part. And our goal was, uh, as you kind of asked also on that uh, GitHub issue was to, um, enable lightning to uh, store the, the, the state of the, of mm -hmm. the training uh, mid-epoch mm -hmm. and to make it in the kind of uh, more like the most advanced way possible right so we wanted to uh, store the state of the loops so being able to start at the loop level uh, also stores uh, like in a fault element way the metrics mm -hmm. so the idea is like if you were to train on like, a, like, as you said, like a massive epoch, right? Like with uh, a ton of images, then you still want to have, when you restore, you will still want your metrics to be properly computed and get the actual correct metric on epoch end. Yeah, okay. Recovery and, within an epoch is probably one of the biggest challenges there. Uh, yeah, exactly. And then what we found to be actually the biggest part is making sure the, the random state which is being used inside of the data set and data loaders is the correct one. Mm -hmm. uh, so it actually works quite well. We uh, do support, and I think you might have seen that in the doc. So we do the the, the, the progress tracking on the loops is, is fully working. So it will just restart exactly at the same batch. Even if you had multiple optimizers, it will restart exactly at this optimizer level. Mm -hmm. Uh, the metrics are being properly gathered and collected, so which means that when you restart, if you keep accumulating there, you will get the right metric at the end of the epoch. And for the data loader state, we have basically two modes right now. We have the automatic one, which we try to do some magic in the back end to kind of wrap your data set, wrap your samplers, try to um, extract the random state of PyTorch, uh, Python, NumPy, like anything for us to kind of make sure that when we, you restart, that state is being rejected and then you will get exactly the same transform you would have yeah. expected if you actually failed. Um, but there's some limitations there, which is if you were to run in theory, if you were to run everything to uh, multiple workers, mm -hmm. then we could potentially support multiple data loaders. But in the case where you don't, uh, use multiple workers, then we have this issue that the global state is actually the data loader state. 
and then there's some overlapping there. So it's actually quite hard to uh, restore the, the state to the data loader in the, in the correct way. I mean, I'm, I might get into the details a bit too much, but what I'm, what I'm trying to say there is, is we, we can support in a fully automatic way a fault tolerant training for, I guess, one data loader, assuming the samplers uh, have like a, unexpected behaviors, like kind of the default from PyTorch. Mm -hmm. Um, but what you can do though, is if you use manual optimi like uh, fault tolerance, you need to implement a state dict on your samplers and on your data set. Mm -hmm. And we will collect the states and restore them on restart. Um, just a um, yes. very, very basic question yes. to start with. Um, all of this, um, all of this state, where is it stored? Does it go in a model um, checkpoint? In a model checkpoint or in a separate checkpoint that is written for, specifically for fault tolerance? So, so, so right now, if you have fault tolerance enabled, it will be written in the model checkpoint. So, as, um, this means I still have to ensure that um, my model is checkpointing pretty much at e um, every epoch. What do you what do you mean? Like um, if if I've set up my trainer to checkpoint yeah. only every ten epochs, yes. And my so so so, so that will still happen, right? Yeah. So 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 you will still checkpoint every ten epochs, but in in Lightning we have a mechanism where if you know you so so we, we have this uh, this side project called Grid.ai, mm -hmm. and we like users can run. Basically, the, the, the scripts directly on the on, on spot instances, yes, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if and as we control entirely the scheduling of the instances, if we know the instance, the spot instance is going to be retrieved, then we are going to send a signal to Lightning, and Lightning is going to exit gracefully. So even if you're in the middle of the epoch, it's going to wait for the next most reliable place to exit and just exit there. Oh, okay. So you're looking for a sick kill, pretty much. So, so not a sick kill because if you if you send a sick kill to the to the to the to the um, to the process, like we don't we can't uh, we can't uh, uh, um, add an handler and we can't uh, do anything. But if you do send, I think we use like sick term right now. If you send a sick term to Lightning and fault tolerance is enabled, we will exit as soon as uh, as possible. And in the checkpoint state, mm -hmm. there will be all the information for fault tolerance. So when you rerun the same script, it will actually just restart automatically with that checkpoint. Okay. And I, I, I have I, I actually in Lightning there is an example for it. So let me let me show you. Um, okay, so I need to. Okay, so let's go on PyTorch Lightning. I think I did an example some time ago. Um, not for manual, but for automatic. So if you go here on the main and you go here, you will see uh, fault element. And here is the example for automatic. So here I have this example where uh, you could run the script here. So imagine you run the script without any failures, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Which means you don't simulate any failures. Then the in the logs at the end, in the weights, you will expect like here's a value you will get. Uh, if you mm -hmm. were to use PyTorch 1.7.1, right? And then here is the same runs where we simulate a failure, right? So the way it will work is uh, okay. we emulate. So here you, you run your script, right? Mm -hmm. And here I have this thing here where it's, I'm emulating this thing. So I'm just going to wait for the sick, sick uh, term signal, right? And when I receive this yeah. thing, then uh, the, the trainer terminate gracefully uh, attribute is going to be modified. So it's going to move from false to true, and then Lightning is just automatically going to exit. When it does so, it's going to save a, a, a point PL auto save checkpoint. Okay. And then when you run that script, exactly that same script. Okay. Yes, go on. Yeah, um, this was precisely what I was referring to um, or confused about. So it goes into a separate checkpoint file that is automatically created. No, it, it, it's exactly the same. Check. So, 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 yeah. So, so this one is the fault tolerant checkpoint which is generated. It's yeah. still a model checkpoint. Yeah. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. State, right? Mm -hmm. um, but we just we name it differently. So when you restart the script, 
you don't need to change your command line. This, this uh, file is going to be automatically be reloaded. So if we detect there is a PL dot auto save checkpoint, then we just reload it automatically. Okay. Um, but it still will only work if the SIG term um, yes. is, is correctly implemented by whatever cloud platform. That yes, exactly, exactly. So if you mm -hmm. want to use grid.ai uh, right now, like this thing is fully, is 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 fully implemented. So if you were to train something with let's say like uh, with multi nodes and something yeah. like you call like when he when he gets killed, the the um, the script will be killed, the checkpoint will be stored, and then the same volumes will be reattached yeah. when the next spot instance is being rescheduled, and everything will just restart as expected. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, I guess that's like the only kind of extra conditions, but I guess it could be possible to, um, on Asia, maybe maybe it could be possible to have a callback. I, I, um, I had co uh, discussions with the Azure machine learning team already yeah. about precisely that, but with this information, I cannot tell them precisely yeah. what we need. So, 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 so we actually use this specific script to assert on grid side that fault tolerance run as expected. So we actually run uh, the spot instances and make sure everything is basically restarting. And at the end in the logs, you should see exactly those values. Yeah. Okay. So this script could be actually be used by the Azure teams to kind of yeah. get this uh, this thing working directly on, on Azure. Yeah. Brilliant, okay. But it also means that um, without this SIG term um, thing in place, yes. we can't use fault tolerance now. So, so it does, but it means it will happen only on when an exception is being raised. So, so it's, it's it's not ideal because you need to have a signal from the outside. Like fault tolerance really happen when um, that, that's really meant when there is like this environment which is going to die or something, and then the checkpoint is being saved. Sorry, I I think I didn't catch what you were saying about exceptions. Why would exceptions so, trigger the fault tolerance here? So 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 we have so so in Lightning we have this mechanism where if an exception is being raised, so imagine there is like a deadlock or in like something which is happening in Lightning which just get triggered. Mm -hmm. We can detect that and we can save a fault tolerance checkpoint if it's like mid of an epoch. Okay. So, so the fault tolerance checkpoint is being saved only inside of a like mid of epoch. Mm -hmm. Do you think there is a way of um, doing something like um, telling telling Lightning to say to always save a fault tolerant checkpoint at the end of each epoch? So, so that happens already. Like you, when you add your model checkpoint at the end of each epoch, like if the if your condition are met, you will save it automatically. Wait, will it save it into the normal checkpoint that my checkpoint handlers um, produce? Or yeah, it's, it's it that, this auto a PL auto save checkpoint. They are the, the auto, they are the, the auto, like they are the same files, right? Uh, it just like this one is is named differently. Okay. So this means I would still at the end of each epoch, I would get this PL auto save checkpoint. Uh, no, you, you will get so. So, if you use a model checkpoint uh, callback, you will get uh, like a checkpoint which contains, uh, I think, the like epoch equal five and step yeah. equal whatever, and that's and, and then you could use that one to reload something. Um, the the PL auto save is meant only for like for during the epoch, right? Because if you're already at the end of the epoch, then it's not really you don't really need fault tolerance because you can already start from like a blank start from the to the next epoch. Fair enough, um, but it means that I save um, if I want to do that, I still have to um, make sure that I save a checkpoint every epoch. Yes, yes, yes. You you could do that. But basically, Lightning will use the latest checkpoint you provide. So. If PL, if you imagine you have, um, imagine you have a PL uh, like a model checkpoint, and you also have fault tolerance activated. Imagine you fail at the at the middle of an epoch, mm -hmm. and then you restart your training. You keep training, and then the, the end of that specific epoch get reached, 
and now mm -hmm. your model checkpoint triggers let's say your validation is good enough right you you say it uh, or even you activated um the, the, the option to save all like checkpoint every epoch then the checkpoint gets saved and then the pl auto save is is not relevant anymore so it just yeah. gets removed yeah, yeah and okay. then the latest would be the one to which which makes sense mm -hmm. okay. um, so this thing really like fault tolerance in this in this case really makes sense if you have like massive workloads uh and uh you want to train on like it, like if you think it this way like if you were to do multi-node training on spot instances Mm -hmm. It's very hard to coordinate, and what you would like as a, as a user is I just launch it. If it fails ten times in the night, I don't care. I, mm -hmm. I just want this to to keep running, mm -hmm. and to emulate like a, a run without failure. And that's exactly mm -hmm. what this thing does. Yeah, that's a brilliant idea. Um, so so this is really good stuff. When I saw that, I thought, Ooh, we want. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's four months for yeah four four to six months of uh, engineering research to. And part <laughs> <laughs> This this is really good stuff because we also use a lot um, Azure Machine Learning low priority compute, which is the yes. same um, which is the same concept as um, yes. AWS spot instances, effectively. Yes. So 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 I guess maybe what we could have in the in the next step is um, if uh, if that's something of your interest, um, we I, I could maybe uh, we explain that if required to people on your side and that script here can be used to uh, to build tests to ensure this thing automatically happens for yeah. So the only thing which is required is sending the signal to the process and then lightning just like, like really what so, so the thing which really happens in the back and I can maybe give you that information here is when you send the signal this attribute on the trainer is going to move from false to true so there is like mm -hmm. a signal handler which <clears throat> has a reference to the trainer and just moves this false to true so in theory you could get away with a callback which ping asia api and ask is if my current um if my current um uh if the current uh sorry uh run is going to be terminated soon or not yeah Right, and if Asia has such APIs, then you could get away with a callback and just mm -hmm. modify in place as a trainer argument, and then I think we'll just exit. Okay, yes, that would be another option. Then, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Okay, but then we would still have to uh, need to find a way of um, manually saving the state of my multiple data loaders. Yes. Okay. So, so, so going to that. Uh, it's actually not too hard, but it requires a bit of uh, knowledge around how PyTorch data loading works, right? So, in in, in you you will need to implement um, like uh, and, and you can unit test that, which is quite neat, right? But you need to implement uh, uh, like a sampler. So 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 what you really need is on the sampler side, you need to have the the the, the state. Like the random mm -hmm. state. So if you were to do like random sampling, they need the, the sample need to be randomly sampled and ordered in the same way as be prior to the failure, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why you want to save the state. But here you might have DDP, you might be using DDP, yes. and uh, you might also be using uh, multiple workers. So the workers doesn't have any effect on the samplers. That's really a data set specific thing, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so here will it will purely be uh, you will need an information about the rank or anything. And there is like this uh, library here, which I was working with to test it, which is called Losh. And they have um, so let's look for samplers. Sorry, what's what's the name of the library again? Uh, Losh. Uh, sorry, Lost. Yeah, I can I can send it to you. And I'm actually going to send you the, yeah, here they have like a test sampler restoring. So maybe we can actually use that. And I think the one I was um, looking, yeah. Um, um, if, you're, if you're showing some, um, uh, um, could you maybe share your screen? Oh, uh, yes, I thought I was sharing my screen. screen sharing. Sorry. Yes, I thought I was. I'm going to, okay, so here these, they have this uh, bucket sampler. And here you will see they were actually prior to, to that, they were actually implementing this thing where they will get all the information, like the random state. Um, they were also uh, getting the, um, the ranks. 
So they were getting all of that and <clears throat> Lightning will just call that method and get this information and then put, like get them back on restart. Um, and mm -hmm. here they had like some tests to validate that everything was widely implemented on the site. So I can send this example to you and I, and I worked with them to validate this was working. So we had, we, we made some run with DDP uh, and uh, with the code and the state were properly mm -hmm. restored. Okay. Um, the one thing that I haven't really wrapped my head around is yes. If I um, if I'm not doing multi-node training, yes. Um, how how does the the sampling then really work? How does Lightning tell each of the nodes to to read the right subset so, data? So 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 first question: Are you using multiple GPUs when you train or not? Um, we have multiple GPUs per node and multiple nodes. Okay, so 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 like like multiple nodes don't really add any extra layers. Oh, you're right. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't add extra yeah. layer of complexities because the only thing you you need is the rank of the process. Yep. Right. So if you have two machines with eight GPUs each, the word size is sixteen, and it means yeah. each uh, GPU process associated process is going to load only one sixtieth mm -hmm. uh, one of the what size of the um, of the data and that's actually the responsibility of the distributed sampler right and so 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 you have the data set which contains all the data and you have the sampler and in lightning when you actually use the dp we replace the sampler to a distributed sampler so there is an in-place replacement um, of the of the sample yeah. of the data set with a distributed yes. sampler, and the distributed yes. sampler knows about its node rank. Yes, but, but that's yes, exactly. And that's only if you use a random sampler or a sequential sampler, which are built in from PyTorch. Like if you use something custom, we have no knowledge about it and we can do the automatic replacement. So yeah. Yeah. in your case where you want to have stateful um, like state stateful components you will have to potentially implement your own uh, where you will have to take care of the potentially of ddp and multiple workers also multiple workers if you want to also save the random state for your transforms uh, associated with your data sets yeah um i mean it, it's not it's not too hard but it's a, it's a, it's a i mean it's like uh, I've done that multiple times, so I'm, like to me, it seems. seems yeah, simple, but there is a bit of knowledge to to the weight. Yeah, you were also um, making this this fix for the bug that I reported a couple of weeks back, right? Yes, the yes. Multiple data loaders wasn't really yes. working on the validation set. Yeah. Um, so, so this means we would now have to. Um, um, so, so, so you will need to make your, your data loading stateful, basically. And we have to um, manually now. So we, so, so at the moment we, we. So, 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 so not manually. You, you implement the function which returns the state, and Lightning will take care of collecting the state and restoring the state. I have. I, I, I think I shared this example with you uh, a bit, uh, like before, yes. right? I'm, I'm just not not sure how how I now transfer that over to a, a distributed world to a DDP world. What What, what do you mean? Oh, uh, you, you what, what you're wondering is like how it works with DDP. Yeah, because we we we're not just just using the 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 default random sampler, I think. And we rely on, <clears throat> on the automatic replacement of the sampler with um, with the distributed sampler. Yes, yeah, so, so 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 I think uh, but that's something I'm going to look into. I think what I can easily implement is a distributed stateful sampler. It's not really hard. I just need to keep the reference to the generator. So uh, that's something which, like L Lightning, is going to improve in that regard to to. Um, to, uh, to add better support for those for those things. But what I wanted to show you is uh, this test, which I have here. Can, can you see my screen? Mm -hmm. Which is test fault tolerance manual mode, right? And here I have uh, a test module. And here, same as before, I'm going to train 
a without failure. I'm going to save the checkpoint and then I'm going to start again from zero, train with failure, reload the checkpoint, finish the epoch or like the multiple epochs and then validate the weight as the same. That's mm -hmm. how we test how tolerant works. And here the user activates manual. So here you need to provide actually two or manual here when you provide the environment variable. And here you can see how I actually implemented a random fault tolerance sampler, which is not supporting distribution. Right now, it's just like one process, mm -hmm. so one GPU. And here you can see how I, be, uh, I actually I did support for it. So here in the state dict, I was actually saving the random state and the current counter, uh, and then I was restoring those values. And here I was also uh, doing the fast forwarding, right? Because if you when you generate the indices, you might also have to to do the fast forwarding uh, right there. So that's how how it worked. And then I can basically check that everything gets restarted. And if I get the same weight at the end of the uh, epoch after the restart, then it means everything has been restarted properly. Okay. As you're saying, we would now need a fault tolerant um, distributed sampler. Uh, uh, so, so right now you would need to, but if I do, uh, in, if you if you rely only on random sampler and sequential sampler, I think I can implement a stateful distributed sampler. Yeah. So I can I can play around and try to automate as much as I can, even for manual. But I think the in the short term, the the best solution would be on your side to to add support for it. Yeah. Okay. Because I'm, I'm I'm pretty swamped right now, so I won't really have the bandwidth yeah. to work on yeah. on that specific problem for like the next uh, yeah one month and a half or something. Yeah, there is no problem at all because at the moment our our main uh, bottleneck next seems to be actually Azure ML support for the SIG term signal. Okay. So uh, do 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 you know if Azure has any API to kind of check the status of the current instance and Kind of know if it's in the in the time in, inside of the zone where the instance is going to be killed. Because if you do have this information, then you can just emulate that with a callback. Um, I don't have the full information there. Um, um, there is some some amount of disconnect between a plain Azure instance, yes. um, a a plain Azure a virtual machine, and the virtual machines. That Azure Machine Learning uses, and not okay. everything that's available on a in terms of APIs on plain VMs is okay. visible to okay, the okay. To So, so there are still some 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 digging and asking. Okay. That so, 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 so I guess I guess the next steps are for you to sync with them and see what is possible, and then we can sync again and, and see yeah. how to 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 get forward. Worst case, I will in, like I will prototype quickly like a very dummy example for you to kind of see how to implement uh, yeah. properly like the, the sampling part uh, yeah. and even the data set for the for the transforms um yeah i think that would be that would be really really exciting to see mm -hmm. um do you have um five more minutes uh or yes do you have another co a corner okay. no, no it should be fine um on a Somewhat orthogonal, uh, yet yet related topic. Yes. Um, I put a, um, a comment in the in the pi, uh, in the lightning discussion um, before Christmas, <clears throat> where um, explaining our, our problem with um, with training self supervised um, embedding models. Yeah. So we have a. Um, we train one embedding model, and then we would evaluate the, um, the. We would like to evaluate the quality of that embedding on multiple data sets. Yeah. And we've so far worked with um, an idea that we pretty much got from from Lightning Boards, where there is a callback that trains a very simple linear model. Yes. Um, but that callback now relies on getting its data from the main model. So the main model needs to know, OK, I need to have my own data for, for training the, the self-supervised learning. Yep. But then there is also another da uh, um, data set that my callback is going to use. And that now, in a way, uh, couples the implementation of the main model with the callback. 
Yeah. And, and this is now getting really messy if we now want to have multiple callbacks, each of them training um, different simple linear models on different labeled data sets. Yes, I understand. And now, so, 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 so your issue is the data is coming from the from the lightning module, right? Yeah, exactly. And each callback is going to fine tune, uh, not fine tune, like kind of fit um, the potentially it's like the classifier of like multiple data sets, right? And yeah. those are associated to the yeah, to to one data loader. To, so you have as many callback as you have data loaders on the val data loader pretty, pretty much yes. right but the current one is not the one you, you you are using but could you use the i mean i know it's a bit of a hack, but are you using the current data loader id from the uh to kind of filter the the callbacks which should be skipped and just use the, the one you are interested in no um, because that would not mean um, if I have, for, for example, seven of these callbacks, the main module would have to have like pretty much seven data loaders. So, 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 so they are run, you, you, you go through them sequentially, right? Yes. Right. So, so, um, so, so you could use a data loader to just activate only the current callback. Yes. Um, we, we so 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 the problem is not so much that we have um, that we don't know how to filter the um, yes. right data to go into the callback. It's more that um, if we um, want to add another evaluation data set, meaning another callback, then we have to modify the data module that the main mod the, that the main PL module is being trained on. Yeah, but I think in that case, the cleanest way would be to get the callbacks directly from the, like the data module seems to be in charge of the callback creations. So I think the data module should take the list of data sets and from that list, create the data loaders and create the callbacks and then those callbacks get injected inside of the trainer. Um, therefore, if you have a new data set, then you, it's being added directly to the data module and the data module is responsible for creating the associated yeah. callback. Uh, um, that would also be uh, um, be an option. I was um, more thinking in the direction of like um, the callbacks doing their own data set handling and enumerating the data sets. So, so you have access to the trainer. So in theory, you could definitely do that, right? Uh, you can do self.trainer.data module and access everything you want, but um, I mean, without without getting too much into the code, it's a bit hard for me to fully grasp like the best design solution. But mm -hmm. my my assumption is like kind of trying to do direct modification on the on the data loader might have some implications because um, from for for some strategies we are transforming slightly the, the data set. So. I mean, I, I think it, it's worth to investigate, but I think the most reliable would just be to for the data module to just get like the list of data sets and then from that generate the data loaders and the callbacks to be injected yeah. instead of the trainer. Yeah, that, that would be an option. Or rather that we have callbacks that tell the data, um, um, the get data module function, like what data sets that they rely yeah, on. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and I think, I don't know if we added that book already, but I think the, the idea was to have like a configure callback hooks on the data module. So that will inject, so, so you could automatically generate the callbacks based on something you wish. Yeah. And then those would be inj injected directly inside of the trainer. But yeah. worst case, you just have it in two lines. Like you just have a data module dot callbacks arguments and that just injects them inside of the yeah. trainer. Yeah. Okay. That doesn't make sense. Okay. Thanks very much. That was yes. Okay. Thanks a lot. Then thanks very much for your time, Thomas. Um, yes. Nice to meet you.